Welcome to the Big Mike Fun Podcast, where you learn about advanced wealth building strategies from real estate investing to creating massive ROI and secure retirement profits. So pour yourself a cup of coffee, grab a notepad, and lean in. Because Big Mike has got the mic, starting now. Welcome to the Big Mike Fun Podcast. I'm the Big Mike. Mike Zlatnik, and today it is my uh, pleasure and a privilege to welcome my good friend, Dave Van Horn. Hi, Dave. How you doing, Mike? Good to see Great. you. Good to see you, too. Great to have you. Dave is the president, I guess, and a co-founder of PPR. It's a, it's a massive note uh, trading shop, as well as he does many other things. He hails uh, from Philadelphia area. Dave, just tell us a little bit about you first, you and your family uh, first, and then we'll talk uh, about some of the yeah, sure. great investing th- things. Yeah, like you said, I'm president and CEO of PPR Note Company, and you know we manage uh, several mortgage and real estate uh, investment funds. And family-wise, I've been married, oh gosh, a long time. Close to 40 years. It's actually scary. Congratulations. And we dated six years. So yeah, <laughs> long, long, it's like the only woman I've ever known. But uh, I have two sons and um, I have four grandchildren. And my one son lives local to me outside Philadelphia. And my other son is in New York, in Brooklyn. You're blessed with a wonderful family. Yeah, no, I am blessed. Everybody's good, healthy and uh I'm one of six kids and I was raised by a single mom. So that's, that's wonderful. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah. Um, So let's talk a little bit about notes business today. So we are recording this in late January, how things are looking on the note front. First question, this is in relation to what's happening with federal reserve and the interest rates. Oh boy. Um, (laughs) Not that I'm an economist. We actually have an economist on staff though. Um, He's our CIO who's a mar- actually a market watch forecaster, a guy named Spencer Staples. So I don't pretend to be him. He's very knowledgeable. Um, but yes, this past year, we bought more non-performing loans than we ever have since we've been in business. Um, we're actually doing a securitization this week. It's closing. Uh, it's finishing today, actually. Um, and uh, that was in, it looks like it was for $230 million total. Um, 198 million was A1 bonds and, and the rate was like 3.1 on that, on the, on the A1. So for us, that's a, that's a big deal. Cause all you, for the last about 16 months, 16, 18 months, we've been aggregating assets up to get to the size, to be able to go to securitization. And for people in your audience that may not be familiar with that, it's kind of like, uh, similar to refinancing the pool of mortgages once we aggregated them all together. Um, and it is a good way for us to lower our cost of capital and to reduce risk uh, when we do the securitization. Now, the funny part was up just up until recently with, you know, potential rate increases, it, it added a little volatility to this, right? Because we were hoping to get a better securitization rate than we did. Although overall, it's still, we still did, we still fared well. Now, the, the question that you're kind of alluding to probably is what will securitizations look like? you know, a year from now, two years from now, three years from now, because it usually when we're doing uh, in this particular deal, we invested around 50 million ish, 50, 55 million was, was committed to buy over time with leverage. And then, you know, you get to an aggregated sum. So the question will be like, if you go into the next securitization, you know, what is the market going to look like 18 months down the road, 16 to 18 months down the road when you securitize, it's usually in the, it takes at least 12 months usually. So, and then, then of course, we're still holding the tail, um, but you have a lot less risk at that point, right? And you'll typically be in these explain, deals. Ex- explain it for the uh, average fifth grader. <laughs> yeah, there you uh, go. So when you securitize, what percentage of that portfolio do you get basically as a bond uh, at that three? Yeah, so I could give you a color. We were pr- probably the total portfolio was like 270-ish. And the, and the amount that they uh, securitized was 230. So that gives you color. And below, you want to get to a scale of around 200 million to securitize, it's almost not worth doing it, or you won't get as favorable terms. That's really what happens. So you want to have a certain level of scale or it's not worth doing it. Almost like if you were doing you know, any kind of uh, capital raise, and, you know, it gets to a point where you know, if you don't do a PPM for at least 2 million, it's probably not worth doing, you know, or whatever, you get the idea. 
Um, no, it makes total sense. It's such a massive economy of scale and the leverage is phenomenal. I mean, you're like at 85% leverage, something like that, if I do the math correct. Well, yeah, it gets pretty high. I, and one of the things they do in the end too, which I, I, you know, I'm not as familiar with that piece of it. I don't, I'm not the guy that oversees that, but it looked like as we were getting closer to the securitization, um, cause we have a line like an MRA, which is a master repurchase agreement, which really is a secured line of credit to the portfolio of mortgages. And as you got closer to the securitization, they would they would allow you to lever up a little bit because they knew they'd get their money soon, that kind of thing. And a lot of times they're the folks doing the MRA are also doing the securitization. So there's some back scrubbing and hand washing there going on, if you know what I mean. So um, but no, overall, you know, we're excited about that. Now, the to your point, most of the time when we're buying non-performing. We're buying pools over time. So it's like a, almost like a dollar cost averaging or a laddering effect. Uh, so, because a lot of times people say, well, isn't there a lot of risk if, you know, the prices, um, you know, the, the interest rates go up, is, it, is that going to create problems? But in theory, over time, the prices of the assets should start to drop or the margins should start to widen. Because right now, with real estate values up so high that traditionally have been recently, um, the margins are tight. And, uh, you know, there, there was as much spread there. Um, so a lot, a lot, a lot of the spread was created in the financing lately. Yeah. Understood. So on that portfolio, is it the entire portfolio non-performing or some of it is already performing? The other stuff that's performing. Um, in fact, the, a lot of it is per- re-performing. So what happens is you're, um, working through those assets. In fact, some of the assets actually got sold off that we had purchased. We just did a sale. I think it was. 20. Are they all first, or are they some mix of seconds? These are these are almost all first. These are all first. So what LTV um, or or, or... It, it would vary because of the you know I'm probably the worst person to ask this because I don't do the acquisitions. My partner John does, but it, it does vary. But um, probably a little higher than in recent years because you know because the real estate values are up. But one of the things that um, you know I express to people is that sometimes it's not always about what you paid for LTV. It's what happened on the exit. So I'll give you an example because I do a lot of REO. I oversee the REO and I approve a lot of the sales. And what you notice is that um, probably half to two thirds of the assets come back to us because we bid them up at sale. A lot of times we're bidding at a full payoff and we want them to come back because we actually get, we can sell it for more. If it comes back, because the market is supporting what's been yeah, happening. Yeah, so in the market, so right now the market's the so crazy, and here here's what it is. It's 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 funny how the market is. Uh, they're actually bidding it up to where it doesn't even make sense, right? They're overbidding on it, and um, they're hoping that the market will continue to go up. And you know how the market gets in a frenzy like that. Um, so we're actually benefiting from that quite a bit. We actually hope this is going to sound funny. We hope properties don't sell at the foreclosure auction. You want to take get, them back, bring it so much better it up and bring it. Sale. We, we don't even have to clean it up. We can sell them as is. It's funny. We even have some in some geographies. We'll sell the asset at the after repaired value without doing the work. That's From what we originally estimated back, you know, 18 months ago, 16 because months. Because the market moved it up. Because the market it, moves so goofy and people are overpaying and they're anticipating it'll keep going up. So you, you, as this became future value as this became without the work. ARV with no work in, in some cases. So it's just bizarre to us. We're, we've, we've never had it better. Um, yeah, some of them are really crazy. Um, in fact, our servicers sometimes will recommend a price. We just had one yesterday. They were recommended around 500000 ish and we sold it for 600000 and my REO agent said, no way, we're listing it higher. And we, and we proved it again. We've been proving it to them all year, basically, because well, they're going on, you know what it is? They're going on past data. Yeah, and that's past, right. So I don't know if you follow the data. Is out but, the, window. the past data is out the window because you're in an up market, right? That, that's right. That's right. So I did a little research <laughs> doing a webinar that's coming up on, on, on the state of the market. And the number that I got, and obviously varies market by market, that last year the rents went up on average around 18% around the country. And the values, the sale prices went up around 18% on average last year. Uh, mm-hmm. I mean, obviously drastically varies by market. I mean, Florida is up a lot more than some of the other markets. But um, the, the 18% increase in price on a $500,000 a year later, 18% is almost takes you like to 600,000. Not, not exactly, but you know, directionally. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 
can make a massive difference, especially on leverage deals. That that in you know, a little bit of appreciation magnifies the ROI substantially. Plus, it's very quick. Um, like you know, a normal market time is like sixty days post foreclosure. We were we were selling stuff on average in ten days. It you know it was blowing right out and multiple offers. We it's not unheard of to have eleven to thirteen offers on a property. You know that kind of stuff. And it's, Depends on the markets, but you get the idea. It's amazing. It's really, it's, really it's amazing. Bizarre, and you're like, is this likely to continue? What do you think? I mean, from your expectation, we think it's gonna. Um, in the short term, it's it's continuing because you know we have a bunch of stuff teed up this quarter. Actually, we have a bunch of closings, um, but we think it's going to level off. I mean, the, the interest rates. The only, the only thing is, it's going to take. I think the Fed waited too long to raise rates, and it's, as it's usually, they're, they're far behind. It's going to take. Slow to act. Yeah, I mean, when you look at like GDP and what normal growth rate is, you know, you have to have inflation because the GDP is so high right now. So it's like, um, I think you're going to see where um, they're going to have to, they would have to raise rates really significantly to kind of curb some of this inflation. So um, it's going to be interesting to see. So I, I but I think overall housing is going to be strong. I mean, I think, uh, New construction was underbuilt still, you know, um, there's, it's household formation. It's driving a lot of this, right? And that's way up. Um, certain categories are way up in household formation. Um, so there's just not enough housing, I, you know, and a lot of people will say, uh, well, what if the seniors all sold their houses? Even, But a lot of them are tending to hold on to them, right? So it's kind of an interesting time, but they even, I saw a stat somewhere, it said like if everybody over 70 sold their houses, there'd still be like 10.5 million household houses short, you know? So it's a big gap. And I just think uh, we're pretty safe in some of those markets. Like uh, for example, the, you know, the B and C class multifamily should be good for a while, even though it seems very robust in recent years, you know, people are like, well, can it continue? Uh, but the signs are showing that it will in the short run for sure, in my mind. So I, I think we're good for a year or two. Looking out farther than that, it's going to be tough, right? It's, you know, I think real estate could start to level off or, you know, you know, stabilize and uh, once things shake out. But it's the same thing with these, um, you know, the vaccines, right? I think they're driving a lot of stuff too. Because we saw it with the foreclosures, um, you know, the moratoriums weren't, uh, fit. it wasn't like the whole country had a moratorium at the same time. It actually, you could see the moratoriums flow through the country with the, with the virus. You could literally watch it. There's like 3,300 counties that we, they all had different rules along the way. It was kind of interesting. You're kind of seeing that now where you're, you know, the advanced countries already had the vaccine and now you're seeing the other countries starting to get the vaccine. And now they're going to start demanding resources and coming back online. And I think it's going to probably create some more inflation and more prices going up, more supply chain disruption in the short term. Anyway, I don't, I'm hoping this supply chain stuff goes away this year. Um, well, but I think we're going to see a little bit more, to be honest with you. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. Yeah, I, I share your sentiment that we 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 are we're likely going to see um, more than a year, probably at least two years of um, higher inflation. What does it mean? Well, I mean, if you look at the CPI, and again, the CPI is sort of limited uh, in in its uh, uh, reflection of real inflation. It was around 7% last year. And the other interesting thing, which is really, really, really good, is that the income, the, the personal income grew around 7% last year. And the growth of personal income, which is both are way above the historic averages. The A um, uh, couple of days back, um, even the CEO of Goldman Sachs announced that they are, they, the, the, there's a substantial wage inflation. And everybody knows this, but um, it's driven by low unemployment. Unemployment as of December was 3.9%. And if you, if you remember the, uh, the Phillips curve, low unemployment means high inflation. It's, it's a pretty, pretty you know, well-studied subject. And then that's, that's, that's the whole thesis about the inflation. And Fed is so much behind. They woke up. They, 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 they got to probably do what, what they announced, four rate increases um, uh, yeah. in 2022. And uh, we don't know how much, but um, it, it's it's very possible that they'll go slower than what they need to go to slow down the inflation. That's the likely scenario, because they don't want to be too disruptive. Stock market is very nervous <laughs> when they do an increase. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, but they're, they're late to the game, though. You could definitely late to the game. They should have already been raising rates, and 
Yeah, I, like I'm with you. I think they're going to have to continue to raise. I think we're going to see the inflation for a while. Um, I think uh, real estate, you know, especially on the rental side, should be a good hedge. Uh, another hedge that we're looking at is uh, mortgage servicing rights uh, because they become more valuable when, when rate increases happen. So we're looking at, at those as well as another hedge. Um, and then we're looking at shifting into some of the other verticals that we do, commercial notes, um, where they're, they're very short term, there's less impact, uh, you know, far out down the road type of thing. So it, it's much more predictable for us. Are you sticking mostly with just that business? Or are you doing some, some multifamily? I think we, we chatted previously. Yeah, we're, no, we're doing some, with some multifamily investments. Yeah, I mean, right now about 5% of our business is uh, multi, uh, but we, we're intending to expand that over the next year or two um, into some of the commercial stuff, and as well as um, you know the origination of, of the commercial mortgages. A lot of it's fix and flip and construction loans, things like that, but um, it's a different risk. It's shorter time periods. Um, you know, Isn't that like industry that broadly competitive? There are all the big shops, the anchors, the Genesis, yeah, and everyone else. There's so many players out there. It's not even funny. It's like, and and it's funny. <laughs> it's funny you announced that you want to go into the business too. I guess that's attractive enough. If you originate and flip, you basically have you know velocity of money. Well, we have a, a maybe we have a little bit of an advantage in a couple ways. One is we we have a, an affiliate that um, we're a facility for and they originate and we have first right of refusal to buy all their assets that they originate. We also have a line of credit so we can sell them off on the secondary market. We can lump them into a securitization if there's one happening or we can cash flow off them and put them on our line and reduce our cash drag. So a lot of times we're using them for other reasons to regulate capital, for example. Um, so when we marry our private equity with our institutional capital, um, we can do okay um, doing some of the you know short-term business loans and fix and flip loans and it, it's you know it's more of a point-based business at that point but uh, but we do okay with that we can make a nice little uh, you know business out of that yeah it makes sense I mean this is your core business you you have all the tools to be able to buy piecemeal package and then sell as a bigger package realizing substantial. Uh, rate uh, rate expansion or, or the spread expansion. Uh, all good things must come to an end. And we're doing this, this is a short version of the podcast. So um, uh, any final thoughts? We'll do a version 2.0. We'll do another one soon. Yeah, so we'll sure. do episode one, episode two. Uh, uh, any other thoughts, comments quickly on what's going on out there? Uh, and, and if folks wanted to reach out to you, how do they reach out to PPR? What's the website? Uh, well, the best way uh, to reach out to me is at pprnoteco.com. Um, I'm also in Bigger Pockets a lot, so I, I, you know, we answer questions in the forums. Uh, you can reach out to me there. We also have a LinkedIn group called Distressed Mortgages Group on LinkedIn. Uh, people will reach out to me there and ask questions, uh, you know, about the note business or, or whatever, <laughs> uh, wealth building, passive cash flow, that kind of stuff. And uh, you know, we love, you know, we love helping people build wealth, you know. So. And you are awesome. And by the way, your conference is much loved. It's just with this whole COVID fiasco, they need to come back. Yeah. So what do you think? Are you going to bring them back? Are you it's excited? You thought about question. doing this virtually? No, I, I think we're going to start out virtually and then we plan to do a live event, although it may be at a different location. We don't know. We're, we're toying. Maybe it'll be in New York, Mike. So. Yeah, we'd love to would love to see it back. And we were all sick and tired of, of COVID and all the, the related uh, unfortunate, you know, no travel. Uh, it's great you know, to see people, stuff. right? It's great to get back. So no, yeah. uh, hey, I appreciate you having me on. And I like it, like you said, I'm more than happy to come back sometime and uh, catch up again. Thanks, Thank you buddy. kindly, Dave. Thank you for your wisdom. Thank you for listening to the Big Mike Fun Podcast. To receive your copy of Mike's How to Choose a Smart Real Estate Fun Book, head to BigMikeFun.com or visit Amazon and type Mike's slot name. Keep listening and keep investing Big Mike style. See you on the next episode.